I pledge allegiance to fried shrimp. I was born along the coast of South Carolina, an hour south of Calabash, North Carolina, which is the seafood capital of the East Coast. And I was raised on baskets of fried popcorn shrimp, served with cold tartar sauce and washed down with sweet iced tea. And you cannot get that here in New York City, which makes me love it even more. If you watch my videos, you've heard me talk about my friend, mentor, my other father, the late British painter, Michael Tyzak. Michael was a treasure trove of information. I could say, Michael, tell me about Sir William Coldstream, or Francis Bacon, or Stanley Spencer. And he could, because he knew all of them, from his years at the Slade School of Art in London in the mid-1950s. Stories would spill out of Michael's mouth. As soon as one was finished, he'd have another loaded in the chamber, ready to go. Fried shrimp was on the menu one night back in 1982, during my spring semester of my junior year at the College of Charleston. I was painting in my private studio, which Michael secured for me, when the payphone just outside of the door rang. It was Michael asking me to put down my painting materials and walk three blocks over to the Joseph Manigault House, an antebellum mansion which was used to host fancy high society parties. He was attending a reception for the Historical Preservation Society. And I explained that I was, I was in dirty jeans, paint splattered sneakers, I looked like a, like a filthy pirate, and there's no way I could attend a fancy reception. And there was silence on the other end. And Michael softly said, never forget who you are. You are a painter. You walk 10 feet tall and bulletproof. You are one of the lucky ones. You get to dream while awake. All of us, we don't choose this thing, it chooses us. And my life changed in that instant. And I said, Michael, I will come. So I put all my brushes down and walked out into the thick Carolina night to the Joseph Manigault house. And I walked up to the stairs into the ante room and they told me deliveries in the rear. And I said, no, I'm on the guest list. They checked it and then they gave me a name tag that said filthy pirate. And I walked in to the ballroom and scanned the crowd of people in tuxedos and ball gowns, but no sign of Michael. I walked over to the buffet table and loaded a plate, a china plate, full of fried shrimp and tartar sauce. And then someone called my name. I turned around and it was Michael, standing with a scotch in his hand, in blue jeans and paint splattered sneakers, standing 10 feet tall and bulletproof. Shortly after my 22nd birthday, after I had just moved here to New York City, I had the honor of winning a Basil Alcazi USA Award, which awards an American painter a generous sum of money to use in any way that artist deems beneficial to their work. And I decided to use my money, as long as it would hold out, to go alone to Italy to study the works of three artists, John Lorenzo Bernini in Rome, Anibale Caracci in Bologna and Tiepolo in Venice. And I remember I arrived in Milan with my backpack and my drawing materials. I stayed in a youth hostel that night and then I made my way to the Grand Train Station to catch my train to Venice. And it was noisy and bustling and all of a sudden out of nowhere a, a very attractive young woman, maybe a little older than I at the time, walked up to me and gave me a big sloppy wet kiss on the lips and then just disappeared. And this is long before I had met my wife Katie and then the doors started to close on my train so I hopped on uh, and sat down with a, a big smile on my face and thought welcome to Italy. And I filed that that image away in my spank bank for the rest of the trip and made my way to Venice. There's something about being in a city by the water that has a very profound effect on the treatment of light in the paintings of those artists who live there. Witness the works of the Hudson River School or the Provincetown painters or the California Impressionists. 
or the New Lynn School, who painted in the early 20th century on the Cornish coast of England. And, and indeed, in my own work coming from the coast of South Carolina, there's something about having little water droplets suspended in the air that gives the light a, a liquid opalescence, a blue quality that is both pervasive and unifying. And that is something that has informed my work for the last 40 years. And I, I believe to this day that Tiepolo, the great 18th century Venetian Rococo painter, was the father of modernism. Not only for the vigor of his brushwork and his astounding facility with his materials, but also for the way that he manipulates the flat picture plane. Before Tiepolo, artists would use a value-based system of light and dark to model and give something the appearance of three dimensions. Light on the light side, dark for the shadow side. Tiepolo dispels with that and uses two colors of equal intensity side by side. One for light, one for dark. And there's something about that equanimity of intensity that creates a, a flatness and, and creates kind of like sputtering sparks of fire that sort of dart your eye all around the picture. Uh, not focusing on one area, but on the entire flat surface. Uh, and indeed, that technique, that idea of, of dual colors of equal intensity has been uh, the engine of my work for 40 years. I was just in the Getty Museum in Los Angeles looking at this Tiepolo called Alexander the Great from 1740. And if you look at this detail, you see that he is painting someone painting someone else. And it dawned on me, that's it. That is our entire job in one image. We don't paint the thing, but ourselves standing in for the thing. Cezanne didn't paint apples, but the appleness of apples. The great marine painter, Frederick Waugh, didn't paint stormy waves. He painted himself looking at the waves. The painting acts as a stand-in for the solitary viewer. When we look at a painting, we stand in the exact spot that the painter did when it was made. No other art form allows this. We see through the painter's eyes and twist our nervous systems around one another in a flash of lucidity and expansiveness. I study weather, rivers, flowers, and make highly detailed drawings of trees not to make them appear, but vanish in favor of a highly crafted new reality. Painting isn't about appearance, but disappearance. We are not matchers. We are makers. The idea isn't to make it look just like the real thing, but to provoke radiance. That's what people pay for. We all know what a sunset looks like. We want your sunset. A painter friend of mine said recently, I don't want my ego to come through in my paintings. I want them to be selfless. I want the exact opposite. Isn't that all you want from art? To inhabit someone else's ego? When I listen to Ella Fitzgerald, or look at Philip Guston, or read Wallace Stevens, I want to feel the foot of that artist on my throat, not letting me up until they're finished with me. The minute you become afraid of offending, or self-conscious, you fail. Artists often ask me how to create a style. And my answer is, if you have to ask that question, then you will never be a painter. You can't manufacture a style. What you can do is make a metric shit ton of work and destroy all of it. Lock your door and make bad work. Try to copy other painters and everything you get wrong is your style. Adjust your thinking. Don't ask, is it good? But rather, does it continue? Flight hours really count. Here is a painting dear to my heart. And if I could liquefy this painting and put it into a syringe, I would inject it into my bloodstream right now. This is Johannes Vermeer's The Milkmaid from 1658. And Vermeer is not yelling political propaganda in our face. He's not trying to outsmart us. He is simply provoking radiance from the ordinary. A milkmaid 
pouring milk into a bowl. He's saying, hey, I found this delicious and complex way of wasting time. Come see. He's telling us, don't try so hard. Art is counter effort. In this rapid streamlined world, art offers us anti-speed. It offers us slow thinking and slow seeing because it is made slowly. And that's one of the most sublime gifts one human being can offer another. Art redeems us because it fails us. Art is lifeless and incomplete. We project our vitality into it, and in return, it compensates us for life's impermanence. Art is not real life, it's fake. By magnifying its limitations, art shows us that perfection is not possible. It's the longing that matters. And that, in my opinion, is what all art is ultimately about, unfulfilled longing. Something can only come to life when we can't have it. Many viewers have asked me to talk about where I go to unwind and recharge. Katie and I bought this house on the tip of Long Island four years ago. My studio and our apartment are in the city, but this is where we go to relax year round. This is the eastern tip of Long Island, and it has similar tidal marshes, clam beds, and world-class surf fishing to that of my native South Carolina. As I've grown older, I've discovered the many benefits of napping. I used to think that a nap was a waste of precious time when it's really a brilliant use of time. I even draped Spanish moss in this oak tree to make it look like Charleston. And this is our poetry bench. The only requirement is that you sit alone and read poetry. The pool, hot tub, and lush garden area are styled after Adventureland at Disney World. We even have a baby elephant to remind me of the Jungle Cruise. The other side of the yard has a little cemetery as an homage to the Haunted Mansion. I love Disney, but my pride and joy is my full service tiki bar, where you'll find me nightly whipping up cold drinks for our friends amidst tiki torches and steel drum music. My father taught me the secret language of fishermen when I was five years old, and I teach my son. Fishing is a process about process. Catching a fish is a bonus. That's not what it's about. Fishing offers a protective layer from the world where you can be in the present tense and shoot the breeze with friends or family, or be alone. But the best part about our house is sharing it with people we love. I grill and through trial and error have become pretty good at it. Friends say that I make the best porterhouse they've ever had, but maybe they're just blowing smoke up my cooler. Either way, it doesn't matter. I smile nonetheless. We eat, drink, and laugh under the Milky Way while a pack of little kids runs across the summer grass catching lightning bugs in jars. And I think of the Bob Dylan quote, it frightens me the awful truth of how sweet life can be. Happy summer. <laughs>